which is so pushed on us by the society that we live in. You know, we are basically told that if we're not super thin, we're not worthwhile. Um, So fear of gaining any kind of weight, fear of getting bigger, um, fear of becoming unfit by stopping the high intensity exercise, um, you know, fear of becoming weak. And, you know, there's, it's so fear of eating different kinds of like fear, like we talked about before, fear of eating carbs because you might get diabetes, fear of eating dairy because it causes, you know, inflammation, like just fear of everything pervades our psyche these days. And I think one of the biggest things is kind of pushing through that and realizing that this fear is created to try and sell us things. Um, yes. And, you know, I think this is probably what you work with people really well on foreign. So why don't you kind of address that fear issue? And then I can talk a little bit more about the specifics of recommendations. Yeah, of course. So, um, look, in a lot of ways, as you're saying, the question is kind of when you look at that fear, as you say, a lot of it is created out of thin air. Right. So um, mm-hmm. a lot of it is not evidence based a lot of it is sold by all sorts of uh, different methods and systems that um, actually working towards using the feeling that you might not be worthy uh, at the kind of weight or in the body that you are in so um, a lot of it is kind of looking at um, fear from not only a personal perspective but what does it mean on a on a larger scale and our society is very much built on this fat phobia. So uh, when you look at overall, like fat people get discriminated really, really badly uh, to the point where they can't get access to jobs, when they are discriminated, you know, in uh, situations where they need health care. Um, this is all a system that this is what I refer to as diet culture. It's a, a system of beliefs that is based on the fact that thinness would mean more virtue, would mean social status, would mean health, and that whoever doesn't fit that bill uh, should be discriminated and oppressed, and that we won't accept anything else than thinness. But in reality, um, the science uh, of our bodies doesn't show that at all. So uh, very practically, what I like to do with those feelings is kind of helping women to find ways to actually work towards a much more balanced way to look at things and work towards beating those fears um, in a kind of really step-by-step way. So if I look at uh, women that suffer with uh, HA, for example, I would say the first thing is to kind of get rid of your scale, as we discussed before. It's not being uh, held back by the numbers or the calories or the BMI. So, um, you know, if you made a a kind of habit into counting calories right now in your recovery, it's probably quite practical because you are able to say uh, if you eat enough. But slowly, slowly, this time is kind of getting back into, okay, uh, how do I feel? Am I hungry? I'm just going to honor that hunger. Uh, Am I tired? I'm just going to rest, you know, it's kind of stop to override those signs. Um, The other thing to look into is definitely to change clothes. Uh, So for me, a lot of my triggers are still very very much in, uh, do I feel I wear clothes that are too tight for me? Uh, Do I feel uncomfortable in the clothes that I wear? That is all gonna reinforce the negative self-talk I have in my head saying, okay, I should change, what should I do? How am I gonna achieve this and all of that? Um, the other thing is to look at uh, what kind of media you consume. Um, so looking at making your social media a lot more body diverse because a lot of the messages we get on social media is that there is one kind of beauty that is acceptable. And that beauty is young and thin, but has curves. Um, you know, it's generally white, uh, it's mm-hmm. quite privileged, it can travel, it can do this, do that, have all the smoothies and, you know, um, you know, I, I won't name anybody, but uh, we've all seen those jokes about one very well-known actress uh, that used to make crazy smoothies, you know, with ingredients that were rare to find and all of that. So this is the ideal beauty that we get 
portrayed every time we open a magazine, every time we look at social media. But the reality is uh, there's a lot more than that. Uh, and there's beauty in, in different shapes and sizes. There's beauty in different colors. There's beauty in, um, you know, people that might be disabled and that um, fight every day to have a, a normal life as much mm -hmm. as possible just fight for their life. So um, I, I share a lot of resources on my website that allow you to really get rid of all the hashtag thin spore, fit spore, all of that. You, we don't want any of that in recovery and really look at different bodies. Um, so in the beginning, you might feel, well, I don't find this beautiful because your eye is trained to see beauty in only one type of, of physique. But the reality is the more you do it, the more you look at different bodies, the more you're going to see how diversity is actually really beautiful. So and then the last thing to do is to deal with that fear, which is typically creating a lot of anxiety. Um, when you look at anxiety, it's actually a stress response in your body. And when you are stressed, mm -hmm. you know, your body goes into, uh, you know, the kind of flight or fight or freeze response right so um we know that when you're in stress response you will digest um very badly your thyroid will work less uh you will not actually um incorporate nutrients from your food like there's a lot of different things that happen in the stress response so a lot of what i do I, on the way to looking into that fear is also dealing with anxiety because a lot of us went into controlling our bodies because in the beginning there was some sort of anxiety mm -hmm. around possibly other things it doesn't have to be uh, body anxiety so dealing with anxiety might be having self-care in place looking at meditation uh, taking a walk in nature, it might be spending time with friends that are not obviously constantly talking about dieting or losing weight. Um, it might be volunteering, it might be, there's really all sorts of different ways that will take your mind away from that fear and that anxiety. And that will also give you a purpose in life, give you a sense of I'm connected to I'm connected to something bigger. Uh, what I'm doing makes sense. I have purpose. So, um, so yeah, those are ways to kind of answer that fear immediately mm -hmm. uh, in really simple, practical ways. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so to get into some of the more specifics of the questions, so Meg LR 1993 asked, um, do you have to gain a lot of weight to recover your periods or is it in the foods you eat? Um, the weight gain really varies a lot and it sort of depends on how, what the size of your body is compared to where it wants to be. Um, so if you've lost weight in the past, um, you often will have to get back to the size that you were before losing weight or maybe a little bit more. Um, I have a blog post where I talk about this and why it might be a bit more. Um, basically, your, your hypothalamus needs to feel extra safe before it turns things back on again. Um, you know, for me, I, I gave myself HA by losing a bunch of weight. And then when I got my period back, I was a little bit higher than I had started. And but, you know, I think really the important thing is not focusing on the weight. Like the, the more you focus on that number, um, the more it's in your head and the more anxiety you create, just like Florence was just talking about. So I think really letting go of it and just trusting that your body knows the size that it needs to be to actually work efficiently and to work as intended. And you'll get to a place where you don't even have to think about what you're eating. You just eat, you move your body and it just kind of hangs out there. And, you know, it's a really, really nice place to be like not having to micromanage all of your food and not having to exercise every day. You just, you know, you move your body when you feel like it. I mean, I play ice hockey a couple times a week now because I love it. It is so much fun. I'm not doing it because it burns X amount of calories and I'm only allowing myself to eat because I'm burning those X calories and I need to control my weight and keep it where it is. I just kind of, I just enjoy my life. I enjoy what my food and my exercise and it, it all just kind of works. And I think that's the, that's such a really great place to be in. And that's where you can get to if you sort of drop the focus on weight, you drop the focus on calories, and you just kind of allow your body to settle where it wants to settle. Um, I also had to, uh, I had to put on a bit more than when I started. Um, 
um, when I was cycling before and it was fine. Mm -hmm. it was fine. Yeah. Yep. You deal with it and you buy new clothes, like you were saying, and it's, you know, you end up feeling so much happier than you were before when you were controlling everything. Next question, very similar. Uh, although this is somebody who says, what, what to do if cross country is your life, but you don't have your period? How do you reverse diet and eat more in a day without drastically gaining weight? So again, like you cannot focus on the weight because, um, you know, I've, I've read stories. I'm not a runner. I don't understand why people run. Um, but, you know, I think I've read stories about women who run and they get really thin in one season. They have this amazing season and then they're never heard from again because they've damaged their system so much by the, the restriction that's required to lose that weight so that they get stress fractures or they just cannot sustain that unfueled exercise for the long term. So I think especially if you're run a runner, um, focusing more on nutrition and making sure that you're properly fueling your exercise, which you're probably not if you don't have a period, um, then, you know, that's really the way to be successful in the long term. Um, Tina Muir has a great podcast. Uh, she actually experienced HA herself. She read No Period, Now What? Went all in, got her, you know, ovulated in about nine weeks and got pregnant. Um, but she's, you know, she um, she often talks to people, coaches on her web, on her podcast, who talk about not focusing on losing weight and, you know, really focusing on fueling your body Um I, she had a couple of people on a few weeks ago and they talked about how they never tell their athletes like don't eat XYZ food. In fact, sometimes they'll, they'll put in their log, eat some pizza today, you know, just to kind of keep it light and keep the food, you know, keep the focus away from the food and the body size and really focusing on properly fueling your exercise because that is the best way to get better at what you're, you know, what you love. We'll talk a little bit more about exercise uh, in, in a few minutes, I think. Um, uh, because I think it can be very challenging to regain your period while you're doing high intensity exercise. You can try. I'm not going to say it's not going to happen, um, but there are many, many women that have come through my Facebook group and that I've worked with that have said, you know, okay, I'm going to eat more. I'm going to get, I'm gaining weight. Um, you know, my period's going to come back. And it's not until they truly go all in, which is cutting out the high intensity exercise that their body actually feels safe enough for their periods to return. And it's not really, it's not really about quote unquote feeling safe necessarily. It's that the high intensity exercise increases your cortisol levels cortisol suppresses your hypothalamus and your pituitary and your ovaries and so it's like this perfect storm for not getting your period back um so often if you are an elite athlete you know maybe the time to work on your period recovery is in your off season you know especially if you're in college and you have a scholarship or you know if you're in high school and this is really important to you um you know, you probably can't regain your period while you're in season, but maybe instead of, you know, going off season and doing all this cross training, you go off season and you really just relax and let your body um, rest and recover your period. And then you can get back into, you know, the next season, much better fueled. You continue to fuel really well, making sure that you're um, eating enough to fuel that exercise and being mindful that our bodies don't naturally cause us to feel hunger to support the amount of exercise that we're doing. Um, so there was a study that was done in men, but I think it translates reasonably well, where they um, either just went to a buffet, ate as much as they wanted, and the researchers measured it, or they did some exercise. They actually burned 800 calories in exercise and then went to the same buffet. So the researchers found that they did eat more than when they hadn't exercised before eating, but they did not eat the full 800 calories. So I think that's something really important to understand as an athlete is that you might have to be extra mindful and cognizant about properly fueling that exercise and maybe even eating if you're not feeling hungry. Um, just to make sure that you are getting the amount of fuel that your body needs. So I think we just talked about um, Parrot, KYB, and Just Doll's questions. Um, so then there's a whole um, there's a whole group of questions about weightlifting, resistance training, um, and again, I think so. The way that I define high intensity exercise is based on a study that was done where they looked at increases in cortisol and other stress hormones 
um, at rest at 40% of maximum intensity of exercise, at 60% of maximum intensity of exercise, and at 80%. So the results were that obviously at rest, you know, stress hormones are at your baseline level. Um, you go up to 40% of your max intensity, and there was really no increase in stress hormones. At 60% of max intensity, um, about half of the participants had increased stress hormones, and at 80% of max, everybody had increased stress hormones. So when you're trying to work on HA recovery, I suggest that you keep your heart rate at about 100 beats per minute. Um, this is about 50% of max intensity, which should be, you know, that, that seems to be pretty reasonable. I used to say 140 beats per minute until I actually wore a heart rate tracker myself and saw that that was like 75% of my max intensity. And I was like, oh, that's probably not so good to recommend. <laughs> Um, so now I say 100 beats per minute. Um, I've been, uh, I'm actually working with Robin Noling, who's the real life RD um, on Insta and what have you. And she said that a really good way to do it practically is can you sing while you're exercising? If you can sing, then your heart rate's low enough that it's not low, that it's not high intensity exercise. And I think that's great. Um, you know, because obviously you can either, you know, you can wear a heart rate tracker or you can, you know, measure your pulse every now and again just by counting for 10 seconds and multiplying. But, you know, being able to sing is, a, is probably an easier thing to do. Um, so weightlifting and high intensity. It is possible to lift weights and keep it low intensity. You know, basically, if you focus on like small upper body movements, very light weights, like maybe five pounds, um, you know, you, I think you have to avoid the bigger muscle movements like squats and lunges and burpees and those kinds of things can very quickly increase your heart rate. So, um, you know, I think weightlifting can be okay, probably no more than three times a week, um, you know, just, but just keeping it light, keeping it low intensity, um, you know, do that for a while. And if you don't get your period back, then consider cutting it out for a few weeks and see what happens, you know, maybe a month. Um, but it could be that even a little bit of weightlifting is too much for your body to recover. Some people obviously can recover that way, um, but maybe your body can't. So I think it kind of has to be a little bit of trial and error sometimes. You know, you try something and then if it's not working, you probably get more frustrated that you don't have your period back. And so it's easier to take that next step um, rather than, you know, some people, if you're like if you're desperate to get pregnant, then often it's you're like, okay, I'm just going to go all in right away because I want to be pregnant right now. But if you don't have that as your motivation, then sometimes you can want to take, you know, you might be okay with taking a little bit longer and that's fine. Like the, I think it's really important that recovery is what works for you. Um, you know, like, because if I tell you, you have to cut out all of your weightlifting and you can only walk and you have to eat 2,500 calories and, you know, maybe you, if, and you don't buy it, you're not motivated to do that. You, you'll do it for a couple of days and be like, screw it. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't do that. And, you know, go back to your old ways. Whereas if it's, if, if you've chosen it, if you've chosen that this is your path forward, then it's much easier to continue, to continue and actually get all the way to period recovery and everything else that goes along with it. Like we talk a lot about periods, but that's really just a marker for your body being healthy and fully fueled and you being happy. And like, there's so much more that really goes into it than just getting your period back. Do you have any, any, any comments that you have on that sort of idea of exercise and weightlifting and all of that? Look, I think it's, uh, for me, the question is, as you said, it's about a kind of time frame, right? And we, we see a lot of um, different posts on the Facebook group where women are saying, well, you know, I try to just uh, eat more and uh, keep my exercise at the same level. And uh, here I am six months later and nothing's mm -hmm. moved. And it's very frustrating. So... Um, there's a point where it's not called half in, right? It's called all in. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think it's kind of, I look, I'm not saying that from a ju judgmental point of view. I totally understand how scary it feels and, and how you feel like you cannot uh, imagine your life without the exercise. But again, what I found personally is that as long as I was managing my anxiety, as long as I 
had sometimes it requires the support of a therapist um, also and it's something I, I definitely recommend for my clients as well when I feel like they need that kind of extra nudge uh, in terms of mental health that I cannot provide mm -hmm. um, but it might be that this is really gonna help you break that barrier you know break that self-limiting belief that well I can't do that yeah you know, this is too scary so um you know i i totally agree with what you said it's about trial and error and nobody knows what you know one person's body is gonna actually do and what it takes for this body to recover might not be what it takes for another body to recover uh, but i would just say for me definitely once i went all in like the process was actually a lot less painful than i thought um, it was it was just kind of when you are on the verge and you have to take that jump. This is very very scary. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Once it's done, you you I think it starts to get easier. Yeah. Now I I forget what did you do for exercise when you had HA? What was your? I was running. Uh huh. Okay. I was running, but I I didn't like running. Really. <laughs> I think I started running because it was kind of a cheap way to mm -hmm. uh, keep myself busy and, uh, you know, obviously doing it in a way like, oh, you know, maybe I can also get this kind of thin tone body that, you know, I've, I've, I wouldn't mind having. Yeah. Um, so, but I mean, at that time, it started mostly because... I started being an expat um, in, in 2006 and uh, I ended up having a lot of time on my hands uh, where I was on my own mm -hmm. and uh, I, I didn't really know anyone where I was living at the time and it was a bit challenging on the, the you know the fact that I had no friends and family around and I had all that time and uh, so running was kind of my way to cope with it mm -hmm. um, and then I got into running it you know it kind of it was impossible to get out of it um and I started doing it more often and longer distance and I've never done marathons or anything like that mm -hmm. I've done mostly days but I used to run definitely three times a week so if you think about it I was not running that much um I think for me it was the conjunction of at the time not eating enough and uh mm -hmm. and then running so it, it was not so much about, oh my God, you know, she's running 60 miles a week. It was not at all like that, but it was enough for my body to say, hang on a minute, what is that? <laughs> so, and, um, and again, it was about not having self-care in place. So I used, because I was on my own, I used to spend my evening after the office running and then I would come home and have like a bowl of cereals. You know, if you think about it, it's completely ridiculous because why would I not actually make a proper meal for myself? Mm -hmm. And it was just really like, well, I'm not going to cook. I'm alone. Who cares? And all of that. So uh, this is something I, I never do anymore. Like even if I'm eating on my own in the evening, I will actually have a meal. I will order something in or I will actually yeah. feed myself. So uh, it's for me, it's like and then. Once you get into that uh, hamster wheel, you know, uh, you feel like you can't get out. You feel like, well, you know, I found this magic way to stay thin or um, eat whatever I want when I'm outside with people, but I'm actually not eating when I'm on my own. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a catch twenty two because mm -hmm. you can see that you sleep less, that you know your hormones get impacted in a different way, that you may start losing your hair and all of that, but. Um, I don't know. It's as long as you're on the pill, sometimes it's difficult to see the signs. Yeah. So it's for me, I, I recognize those signs much later when I tried to conceive, when I came off the pill and uh, nothing that's came so back. Yeah. 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 I think that's, so, I think that's actually a really good point. Um, so if you're on the pill and you stop bleeding on the pill, like major red flag. Okay, you need to take care of this right now. Um, yeah. But if you're on the pill and you're bleeding every month, it's really hard to know. So I think it's really a matter of assessing your, like really being honest with yourself. Like what are your motivations behind exercise? 
Are you trying to control your body size? Are you actually eating enough to fuel your body? I think is a really, really important one. Um, and if you do that while you're on the pill, um, you know, and then you come off, you're much more likely to get your period back than if you wait until that point and then try and kind of fix things from there. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I'd almost recommend, I'd almost recommend to people who are on the pill, like just go off for a few months, use alternative yeah. contraception, obviously, and see what your body does. I think, um, you know, we're, we're thrown, the birth control pill is thrown at us very, very easily. And, um, you know, there, there are other practitioners out there that have written books. Um, I haven't read them yet, but um, Beyond the Pill by Dr. Jolene Brighton and um, The Fifth Vital Sign by Lisa Hendricks and Jax are, are two that I think would be really good for people to check out just to learn about some of the other side effects of the pill and how it can affect your hormones. And, you know, it's not necessarily the best thing. It's certainly not something that should be given out like candy um, the way it is. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would encourage you if you're on the pill now to you know think about taking a break and just see, see what happens. Um, it's certainly easier to fix things um, sooner rather than later. And, you know, especially if you're thinking about getting pregnant down the line, fixing things now rather than at the time when you are ready to be pregnant will make everything so much easier. I think, so, you know, there's two things I would add to that is recognizing how obsessive uh, some of these behaviors are. Mm -hmm. So if you kind of uh, decide not to take part in social events because you it means you won't be able to exercise or you won't be able to keep up with the routine that you set up for food. Um, that's one of the signs where you would say like, mm, that's probably not the best thing to do. Um, and then, I mean, for me, I had been on the pill forever because I started the pill as a teenager at the time, actually helped with acne. And, um, and this is also something, you know, if you've been on the pill for a decade or more, it's actually quite difficult, as you say, to recognize that there might be something wrong. So um, I totally agree with saying sometimes come off for a little while and see what's going on. Because for me, I probably was um, stuck in HA for much longer than I was actually diagnosed for. Okay, our next question is from Amy Stackhouse. Um, so saying, I've restored my weight back to when I was having a period. How long will it take to start cycling? And are there any clear signs to show you're almost there? Obviously, every person is unique. We can't say for any one person it's going to take a month or it's going to take two months or it's going to take six months. Um, you know, if you work with me directly, then we can kind of talk through a lot more and, you know, I can give you a better answer. But even then, I don't have a crystal ball. And so it's impossible to say for sure. Um, I can tell you you're going to get your period if you have ovulated. That I can tell you. Um, but so that's really the clearest sign that you have is sort of some of the things that happen to your body when you're getting close to ovulation. Again, we have a chapter in this in No Period, Now What? Um, so it's basically one of the easiest things to recognize is an increase in what's called egg white cervical mucus. Um, our bodies are just so cool. Like when you get close to ovulation, the, the quality and quantity of your cervical mucus changes basically to make it more amenable to sperm getting through and getting up to that egg so you're so you can have fertilization and make a baby. Um, so it tends to be very much more slippery than what you will probably have noticed before. Um, it like if you look on the toilet paper after you've had a bowel movement, that's that's of, that's often the best time to see it. Um, you know, it'll look like jelly, like egg whites. And if you, you know, if you pick it off the toilet paper and like stretch it between your fingers, it, it does that, you know, you can get it to go like this. Um, you know, and I think when you, when you've never looked at it before or thought about it, it's, it can be like, we often think that things like that about our body, it's like gross and disgusting, but like as a biologist, to me, it's just so cool and interesting. And I think thinking about our bodies in that way, like how amazing they are, instead of thinking of them as being gross and disgusting, like it just like having that mindset shift and in, enjoying and appreciating your body can just really make, you know, it just makes your life so much more fulfilling. And, you know, like the negativity um, just around so much of what we do like everything's negative 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 it just like leads you to be in this like 
overall state of anxiety, like Florence was talking about all the time. And, you know, it's just, there's no benefit to that. Um, so our bodies are cool. Cervical mucus is cool. Um, you know, you can reach up into your vagina and feel your cervix. And if you're getting close to ovulation, it will be higher than when you're not close to ovulation. Also really cool. Um, it might be challenging for you to do that, but you know, it's worth a shot. Um, so those are sort of the, the, the major physical signs that you will notice. Um, you can also use ovulation predictor sticks, and those are positive when you have your luteinizing hormone surge, which means you are going probably going to ovulate. It's not 100% guaranteed, but it's it's likely. Um, and you can also measure your temperature on a daily basis, sort of first thing in the morning. Um, that goes up after you have ovulated. So it's not a good thing for planning um, intercourse for getting pregnant, but it can tell you when you have ovulated and therefore you can expect a period. Um, but I would say the biggest thing that you'll notice as you work toward recovery is changes in your cervical mucus. Like often women with HA have no lubrication whatsoever, no libido, uh, very not interested in anything. Um, and as you recover, you'll notice that you do see more lubrication, um, more cervical mucus sort of all the time time um, until it gets to the egg white. You can have a few patches of egg white before you do actually ovulate. Um, and that's you know not uncommon, but all of that kind of tells you that your body is getting closer to ovulation and then the, therefore a period. The next question is from Marta and it's very similar. Um, the part of her question that's different is how common is it not to have your period back again? Um, I think if you've been working on recovery for a long time, um, maybe, you know, think about either getting my book or scheduling a call with me because often there are things that we can tweak. Um, you know, somebody thinks she's been working toward recovery, but she talks to me, tells me what her day is like. And I'm like, oh, well, you need to add, you know, you're hardly eating any carbs. You need to add carbs or like you're, you're exercising in the morning with no fuel. So, you know, that's putting your body in an energy deficit. So there are a lot of different little things that we can look at. It's not just about the 2,500 calories and the cutting out high intensity exercise. So, um, you know, there, there are other things that we can do. And if you don't have a period back, um, there are some medications that we can try to kind of jumpstart your body, not estrogen and progesterone, which is what a lot of doctors will say, um, but Clomid or Femara or naltrexone or there's there's a lot of different options. Um, there's a chapter in the book called Still No Period that would be a good place to start.